Hear these readings from John's Gospel of the events that have taken place in the days prior to Jesus' resurrection. Pilate had Jesus taken and whipped. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and dressed him in a purple robe. Over and over they went up to him and they slapped him in the face. The soldiers took Jesus prisoner Carrying his cross by himself, he went out to a place called Skull Place, or in Aramaic, Golgotha. That is where they crucified him, and two others with him, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Knowing that everything was already completed, in order to fulfill the scripture, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was nearby, so the soldiers soaked a sponge in it, placed it on a hyssop branch, and held it up to his lips. When he had received the sour wine, Jesus said, It is completed. Bowing his head, he gave up his life. It was the preparation day, and the Jewish leaders didn't want the bodies to remain on the cross of the Sabbath, especially since the Sabbath was an important day. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of those crucified broken and the bodies taken down. Therefore the soldiers came and broke the legs of the two men who were crucified with Jesus. When they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead, so they didn't break his legs. However, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. After this, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate if he could take away the body of Jesus. Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but a secret one because he feared the Jewish authorities. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took the body away. There was a garden in the place where Jesus was crucified, and in the garden was a new tomb which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish preparation day and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus in that tomb. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Solomon bought spices so that they could go and anoint Jesus' dead body. Very early on the first day of the week, 
just after sunrise, they came to the tomb. They were saying to each other, who's going to roll the stone away from the entrance for us? When they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away, and it was a very large stone. Going into the tomb, they saw a young man in a white robe seated on the right side, and they were startled. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has been raised. He isn't here. Look, here's the place where they laid him. Go, tell his disciples, especially Peter, that he is going ahead of you into Galilee. You will see him there, just as he told you. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Please stand for our processional hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today. seated. Welcome to today's service of worship, whether you're here with us in person, joining us live via Zoom, or watching on YouTube, listening on the radio in times to come. We are glad to have you joining with us for this Easter Resurrection Sunday. To those who are here in person, we ask that you grab those pew pads, fill those out, pass those down the pew, send them back to see who is worshiping with you maybe familiar faces, and maybe he's saying, I should know that person's name, I should know that person's name. 
It's a way to find out. Otherwise, simply just look at them and say, I should know your name, but I'm drawing a blank. Oh, that's, at least that's what I do. It's taking quite a while. I keep forgetting people's names. So model that for me. Make me look good. Yeah. We do extend a special welcome to our visitors. If it is your first time here, there are some welcome bags. If you haven't already gotten one, make sure you grab one of those. Today during worship, we will also be welcoming our newest members, and we have a new welcome banner that was created for this occasion to be able to welcome new members into our family of faith here. Many different things coming up this week. Take a look at the events happening there in the bulletin. Big thing coming up next weekend will be Feed My Starving Children, mobile food pack. Please sign up for that. If you haven't signed up or if you aren't able to be there, please consider giving financially to be able to help provide food for children and families all around the world. So a great opportunity there. Please, above all, keep that in prayer. Are there any other bits and pieces that I didn't include that should be significant announcements? If not, let me open our time together as we open with prayer. O God of all our days, we come this morning with eager anticipation. We seek to know you, to see you, to touch you. Open our hearts that we might experience you anew. And open our lives that we may be faithful witnesses to your resurrection. May we with shouts of joy proclaim your steadfast, liberating love to all people everywhere. Amen. But Kay, to join us, lead us in our call to worship. Please stand if you are able. Hallelujah. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Darkness has been vanished. The light of hope has come. come, let us worship and celebrate the good news. Alleluia. Christ is risen. Sing praise to God, for Christ has risen. We who have doubted, rejected, and turned away are invited to express before God all that keeps us from claiming God's promises and living in peace with our sisters and brothers. 
Let us open our hearts to make room for the newness of life Christ offers. Let us pray. Gracious God, in whom there is no partiality, we confess that our love is limited to those with whom we choose to associate. Our faith is restricted to what we can prove. Our service is reduced by our greater interest in the trappings of success. We have allowed religion to become a compartment in our lives rather than relationships that influence and transform us all. Holy and gracious God, forgive our unfaithfulness and make today a time of new beginnings. Amen. Through Christ, God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of his cross. The victory of our Lord over sin and death is available to us through faith. Sin no longer has power over those who belong to Christ. Our sins are forgiven. Thanks be to God. The peace of Jesus Christ be with you. I invite you to share the peace of Christ with others this morning. seated and just for the record there was some dancing in the aisles going on over here amen our scripture reading today prescribed by the revised common lectionary comes to us from the acts of the apostles the 10th chapter this is peter in the home of roman centurion cornelius Peter sharing his testimony, telling who Jesus is and why Jesus died on the cross and was raised to new life. Listen for the word of the Lord. Peter said, I really am learning that God doesn't show partiality to one group over another. Rather, in every nation, whoever worships him and does what is right is acceptable to him. This is the message of peace he sent to the Israelites by proclaiming the good news through Jesus Christ. 
He is Lord of all. You know what happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism John preached. You know about Jesus of Nazareth, whom God anointed with the Holy Spirit and endowed with power. Jesus traveled around doing good and healing everyone oppressed by the devil because God was with him. We are witnesses. We are witnesses of everything he did, both in Judea and Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him up on the third day and allowed him to be seen, not by everyone, but by us. We are witnesses whom God chose beforehand, who ate and drank with him after God raised him from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin through his name. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Wait, Jennifer. I'd like to invite the children to come forward. So today I'm going to hold something up here that's kind of small, so you might come close to me today. Easter, isn't it? Wow. So, so today is Easter, and sometimes, did you hear these words? He has risen, or Christ has risen. What does that mean? I don't know. He is risen today. That's what we say. Kind of rhymes, doesn't it? Yeah. So we have a story we're going to tell. So who here likes to who here likes to read stories? Anybody like to read stories? Yep. And stories usually have a beginning. That's kind of when you find out who what the story is about or who the story is about. So our story today is going to be about Jesus. Do you remember the beginning story of Jesus? Well, usually when we tell stories about people, we tell about when they were born. So, do you remember when Jesus was born? Yeah, way before us. Yeah, way, way before us. But do you remember the story? What happens in that story? You were just... He was born in a manger. He was a baby, right? He was walking for a long time. Yes, his mom and dad were walking for a long time before he was born. You're right. And then he had to walk a long time after, right after that, too. He needed to go to Egypt to be safe. So, so Jesus was born. And then when we read our stories, we have a middle part. And that usually is when action happens or things happen. Do we know any stories about Jesus doing things? Not so much when he was little, but we do know about when he was about, about your age, right? And then we know when he was a grown-up, he was doing some things. What were some of the things he did? He was helping people, he was healing people, and he was teaching people. Oh, that's the next part. Can you hold that for a second? Yeah. So, so he was telling people about God's love. He was telling about a new way to live, that we could share God's love with other people. And he then told people a little bit later on our conclusion part of our story about how he was going to die. And did the, did the disciples understand that right away at first? No. You know, I think if I was there, I probably wouldn't have understood that right away either. But we already know how it ends, right? Anybody here ever look at the back of the book and figure out how it ends? So we already know how it ends. So let's take a peek at my story here. And this is a story that is a box, not a book. So it doesn't have pages, it has a box. So that conclusion part of our story, or what we think is the conclusion, started out 
on what we celebrate as Palm Sunday. Jesus was going into Jerusalem, right? And then we have one of the next parts. Do you know what that picture is all about? What do you think? The Last Supper, right? Jesus shared um, that meal with his disciples, and he was telling them more about what was going to happen. They weren't really understanding it very much very, at that point either. And then what, what is, do you see that picture right here? That's one of our windows. Can you see the window here at church? Right behind me. Yeah, Jesus is in the garden and he's praying. And he, he's, he wanted God to, to help him. Do you ever want God to help you? Yeah. We, we do have this. Sense. Right behind you is when you see the sheep. Then um, some of the, the people who were there at the time were a little bit worried about what this new thing Jesus was talking about was all about. They weren't sure about it. And they, they um, decided that he was going to be put to death. So there is what you might think is the final part of the story. But is it the final part? Jesus died on the cross. Is that the end? Do you think so? What happened after that? On the third day, he rose. Those, those women went to the tomb. They went there and it was empty. Right. So we thought that final part was when he died, and it wasn't, was it? Why is that so important? You don't know? I wonder. Yeah. So he came back. He said he was going to do that, right? He told the disciples he was going to do that, and it happened. And because we... Uh, because that happened, we don't have that be our ending either. No. We get to live in heaven as well. Yeah. Isn't that pretty awesome? It is pretty awesome. So that story is a really important story. Did you know that there are some people who don't know that story at all? Yeah. It's hard to believe because we know that story. We've been talking about it today. We've been talking about it in church. Yeah, like the last time we had church, like the last time we had Sunday school, we talk about that story, don't we? But there are people who don't know that story. We colored it. Yes, you're right. We colored it. And so we know this story, and we have a job to do. Are you ready for your to, to get all straightened up for your job to do? Okay, here's your job. Tell somebody that story. That's your job. Like mom? Yep, yeah. mom would love to hear you tell her that story. I know she would. Mm -hmm. So we have this awesome gift that God gave us, the love of Jesus, and we need to share that with other people so that they can also know about that special awesome gift. Are you ready? So we're going to try something today. I'm going to give you a little help so we can practice first, okay? So we're going to say Christ has risen, and then I want everybody else in the congregation to say Christ has risen indeed, okay? So we're going to say Christ has risen. You're going to say Christ has risen indeed. Are you ready? Okay, ready? Nice and loud. Christ has risen. Christ has risen indeed. All right, let's pray. Loving and gracious God, we thank you so much for the gift of Jesus. We thank you for all the gifts that you pour out on us each and every day. We thank you for our friends and our family. We thank you for the warm place to live, the wonderful food to eat. We thank you for friendships and family. We ask that you would help us to share your story with everyone that we meet, that they may know and feel that gift as well. We pray all these things in Jesus' name and all God's children said, amen.
Let us pray. Almighty God, we ask that you open our hearts, that we might sense your Spirit's leading, that we might encounter the risen Lord once again today through the hearing of your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our heart be pleasing to you, our rock and our reading. Amen. What a story that is. What a story to tell. What a testimony that we read the opening of Scripture today from Mark's Gospel about the resurrection of Jesus that Luke writes about through Peter. Mark's Gospel, that end, it just ends right there with They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. That's where the end of most of the critical original manuscripts of Mark's gospel end. The tomb is empty, and this young man in the tomb tells the women, go to Galilee. That's where you're going to see Jesus. But they were afraid, and they said nothing. Why doesn't Mark tell the rest of the story? This isn't the ending that we know, is it? Not at all. There's so much more. But this ending begs for the reader to ask, so what happened? What happened then? Tell me more. Tell me what happened. If we were reading this letter for the first time, we might think we skipped over something and He's sorting through, going back through, looking at it, saying, what did I miss? What did I miss? And that's when we see it, when we go back and we read through Mark's gospel again. We flip back through it, and we realize that Mark has already told us time and time and time again about Jesus' resurrection. He has foreshadowed it in so many places throughout the gospel. And it's places where it's more than just Jesus' resurrection from the tomb. It's Jesus' resurrection moments in the midst of everyday, ordinary life. Even though Mark's Gospel is the shortest, written with the simplest Greek, its original writing, it is deep, it is powerful. I want to unpack it a little bit more. So early that morning, That first Easter morning, just after sunrise of the new week, the women go to the tomb, expecting, fully expecting to re-encounter death. These are the women who had been sharing in Jesus' ministry throughout Galilee. They were still in the midst of shock, overwhelming grief, after witnessing the crucifixion of their teacher, their friend, their loved one. The execution of the one that they believed was to be the Messiah. The one who was to bring back the glory days of King David. All their dreams and expectations were shattered just a few days before. This final act of anointing Jesus' body was something that they needed to do. Not out of compulsion, but out of deep reverence and respect. It was their final gift. They were confused. When they get to the tomb, confusion gets even deeper. Nothing was as they expected. This huge stone, which would have been six foot in diameter, probably a foot thick with a big flat piece on the bottom, that would have taken several strong soldiers to get underneath it and push with all their might to get it up off of that flat spot and to roll it in that carved trough to be able to open the tomb. It was already rolled away. So as they walk up to it, they're already getting hesitant. What happened? And then as they get there, Jesus' body was no longer in the tube. Instead, some young wannabe thug, probably, they perceived it as. This young man, Mark puts it politely, was sitting there in that spot where Jesus' body had been laid. 
Now, the gospel stories don't say this, but do you think that maybe those women were about to give that young man some true discipline after a thorough interrogation? What are you doing in there? What did you do with his body? Mark's testimony says that the young man encounters them and says, don't be alarmed, don't be alarmed. I'm guessing he wasn't quite that calm. He probably realized, they're about to do something to me I don't want to be in. Whoa, stop, time out, whoa, 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 don't hurt me, don't hurt me. I'm just the messenger. I didn't do anything. Jesus isn't here. You need to go to Galilee. Go to Galilee. That's where Jesus is. That's where you're going to see him. Just as he told you. Now again, I'm wondering, what were these women thinking? We don't know. I'm sure their minds were really spinning. And maybe, maybe for a moment, they thought, is Jesus just the greatest showman ever? Maybe he really isn't dead. Maybe it was all just this big, complex, magical act. I don't think they, quite, they went that far. They may have questioned that for just a brief moment, but they knew it wasn't because they were there at the foot of the cross when Jesus was painfully crucified. They knew it was no magic act, but they had to go back to Galilee. Maybe by going back to Galilee, where everything was so great. Everybody wanted to be around Jesus. Oh, let's go to Galilee and everything's going to go back to the way that it was. That's what we want to get today, right? We want to go back to the way things were when life was so much better. They may very well have thought that as well. They didn't know exactly how, but they probably each had their own ideas of that. But right then, Mark's gospel comes to an end. Overcome with terror and dread, they fled from the tomb and said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Period. We like the Hollywood version of the resurrection story in which all the disciples go out to the ends of the earth shouting, Jesus is alive. The women and the disciples who found the tomb early that morning, they didn't run away shouting, he is risen, he is risen indeed. None of that. Instead, they were given an invitation, a command, to go back to Galilee and to rethink everything that had taken place over the past three years, to reflect on the whole story in light of its ending. And that is what we need to do yet today. We need to go back through and read Mark's Gospel and to see those resurrection moments and connect those with our life. Most people attending Christian church this morning in the Western world are expecting to hear those celebratory shouts, He is risen! He is risen indeed! They're expecting to sing joyful songs of celebration that just oh, they make us feel so good. And yet, if that's all that we experience, if that's all that we encounter as we gather together for worship, while it's appropriate, if that's it, and nothing more happens, then we've only been inoculated with just enough Jesus so that we don't have to worry about getting infected with this whole Christian thing for quite a while, at least you know, until a booster comes available at Christmas time. Then we can get inoculated again and Within the church, we like to somewhat pick on those priester peoples, Christmas, Easter, or CEOs, Christmas, Easter, and occasionally other times. And yet that is who we all are in one way or another. Because even if we come to worship on Sunday morning on a regular basis and that's it, we're really no different. This ending, this joyful good news, it's only the beginning, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as Mark puts it. This isn't even an appetizer for a great meal. This is just 
like we can smell the delicious breakfast from this morning. It's that smell of delicious food making us hungrier and hungrier, wanting more. Our spiritual appetite increases when we hear he has risen. He has risen indeed. We are to leave this time of worship hungry for more. Easter is not just a day. Easter is a season. It's a season of seven weeks, or maybe to be more intentional, a week of Sundays. 50 days, beginning today, including Pentecost Sunday. Season of Easter is intended to be a joyful time for the next 50 days, celebrating the presence of the risen Christ in the church universal. The early church put such an emphasis on joy during this season of Easter that they didn't allow fasting. They didn't even allow kneeling in prayer until after Pentecost. The first seven weeks of our new life together after Easter is similar to that of a newborn baby. The nourishment, the mental imprinting, the assurance of, be, of that baby being safe, being cared for psychologically, physically, that is important. There's no way that we would celebrate a baby's birth, set him in the crib, and come back seven weeks later and expect them to be able to make something out of the formula that we put in the crib with them. I mean, hey, they've got formula. They've got some baby food. They'll, they'll be fine, right? No, we would never do that. Our faith life is similar. Just imagine what our faith life would be like if we attended to our faith life in the way that we attend to a newborn baby. That is our challenge for this season of Easter. The ending of Mark's gospel leaves us a little bit uncertain. On one level, it just falls short, as if Mark forgot to finish it, which may be why some of the later manuscripts add in additional text. But on another level, it mysteriously invites us to break the silence that Mark leaves by telling the rest of the story or retelling that story over and over until we grasp the real ending. Resisting our flight instinct, run away, allowing instead our fight instinct from within ourselves to be transformed into a ministry of shared healing, shared ministry with one another, a household of ministry. Just as the women that morning expected to re-encounter death, we too must re-encounter our little death moments. As I mentioned on Thursday, we experience the person of Jesus Christ giving us new life out of our lived experiences of death. And as I said on Thursday night, true faith does not come from us overcoming our own experiences of death. That's just therapeutic self-help. True faith comes in turning these death experiences over to Christ, allowing Christ to give us new life. True faith is encountered through the experience of ministry, the experience of being ministered to by others, and then the experience of being able to minister to others. That is what Easter is all about. Not just Easter Sunday, but the Easter season. That is what our Christian faith is all about. To live as resurrection people, we need to confess, submit ourselves to the brokenness and the experiences of death in all its various forms. We need to experience ministry from and to one another. The church for too long has failed to teach that true meaning of faith as ministry to one another. True faith is more than just this rational, cognitive understanding, belief in certain doctrines. It is to be the real presence of Jesus. True faith is about an encounter with Jesus, receiving ministry from the triune God, being united with Christ, ministering to others, as if we are all little Christ, using the words of Luther. True faith cannot be fully or adequately articulated in any written statements, any doctrines, 
It's only encountered amidst that powerful act of testimony, of telling our stories, making connections. We need to learn to tell the stories of Jesus. We need to learn to tell others about our encounters with the risen Christ. We need to learn to tell others what Jesus has done for us. But that's not what the world wants us to do. And we've turned the nourishing stories of Jesus, as Bruce Reese Chow says, into these little empty junk food for our souls. It's no wonder that people are looking everywhere except the Christian church for spiritual nourishment in today's world. We need to reclaim those powerful, nourishing stories of ministry. Now, Mark was no professional writer, and yet by telling his story about the person of Jesus Christ, he's become one of the most published writers in all of history. Luke, who wrote Luke Acts, that two volume, he's a little bit more of a polished writer. He writes a good, organized account of what has taken place. And it's there in the midst of that that we have Peter's testimony of his little, one of, one of his many death moments. Here's Peter after the resurrection, even after the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And he's still trying to make sense of it all. In the verses just before this, we find Peter sitting on a roof, praying, sorting through, trying to figure this all out. He kind of goes off by himself, a little retreat of sorts. And he has a vision saying, take, eat this food that by Jewish customs is unclean. And Peter refuses over and over. And then Peter finds himself in the home of Cornelius, a Roman household, Gentile, outsider. Oh. And there he is. In the last spot that he thought he would ever find himself, but probably reflecting back to his time with Jesus and the disciples as they went north of Galilee. And they were in that red light district, as I called it a few Sundays ago, where Peter said, you are the Messiah. And now here in this spot amidst all these Gentiles, Peter continues to become aware of little death moments, things that he needs to give over and to say, I was wrong. Here he is, he's aware of those customs, they've got new meaning. Cornelius, along with his entire household, are now to be part of God's holy family. Peter can't process it and make sense. But he declares, we are witnesses to all that has happened. And you understand it. You get it. He gives testimony to the transformational power of Jesus' death and resurrection. Testimony. For some, that's a scary word, but it's simply a statement from a witness. Jesus is risen. He is risen indeed. That is a testimony. That is to be an introduction to our larger testimony. That joyful shout is an invitation begging us to ask for more details, inviting others to ask us more. Tell me, how have you encountered the risen Jesus? He is risen. He is risen indeed. How do you know that? Where have you encountered Jesus? What difference does Jesus make in your life? And it is there that we simply can say, here is where I have encountered the risen Jesus Christ. And no one can argue with you. That is your testimony. No, that, that isn't your testimony. That's God's testimony at work, in you, through you, and as I like to say about myself, but all of us, even in spite of you, in spite of us, Jesus' testimony is alive. 
Go and share your testimony. Allow others to encounter the risen person of Jesus Christ as you encounter the risen person of Jesus Christ afresh and anew. As we embark on this joyful Easter season, this journey ahead of us. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our response called as partners in Christ's service as we prepare to receive new members. Call as partners in Christ's service, all true ministries of grace. We respond with the moment when fresh new lives and faith to trace. May we learn the art of sharing, side by side and friend with friend. be seated and I invite new members to come forward to join me up here on the chancel. On behalf of our clerk of session, Dave Erickson, who is unable to be here today, I present the following list of individuals who by previous action, you can come right up here, by previous action of your session have been received into the membership of this congregation. We have Christine Alwyn, Daniel Alwyn, Wendy Peachy, Thomas Larson, Frida Pretorius and Gerhard Pretorius. You come to us as members of the one holy Catholic Church into which you were baptized and by which you have been nurtured. We are one with each other's sisters and brothers in the family of God. We rejoice in the ministry that you bring to us as you join with us in the worship and mission of this household of ministry. It is fitting that together we all reaffirm the, the, our faith, the covenant into which we were baptized, claiming again the promises of God, which are ours in our baptism. Hear these holy words of Scripture. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people who are God's own possession. You have become this people so that you may speak of the wonderful acts of the one who called you out of darkness into his amazing light. I invite you to stand as we affirm in responsive manner our confession of faith from the Apostles' Creed. 
Do you believe in God the Father? We believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? We believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. I invite you as our newest members to turn and to face the cross as you answer these questions. These questions are not answered to me as the pastor or to the church as an institution. It is to God. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world you? Do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept him as your Lord and Savior, do you? Will you be Christ's faithful disciple, obeying in his word and showing his love and compassion, will you? In the power of the Holy Spirit, will you participate actively and responsibly in the worship and mission of Christ's church through your prayers, your gifts, your study, and your service, will you? Turn around. Let us pray. Almighty God, we praise you for calling us to be a servant people, all ministers one to another, for mysteriously transforming us into the gathered body of Christ, the church universal. We thank you for choosing to add to our number sisters and brothers, share faithful ministry in this time and this place giving testimony to the new life rising from our death experiences. Holy Spirit, move us into deeper forms of relationship and communion so that our ministries of love for one another may be tangible means of experiencing the presence and personhood of the risen and living Christ. All honor and glory we give to you, our triune God, both now and forevermore. Amen. I ask that you stay here. I've got certificates and some gifts for you. We invite everyone to join us following the service in the fellowship hall to receive our newest members. Let us offer a welcome of thanks to them. As I hand out their certificates and gifts, I invite you to be seated and I invite the ushers to come forward to collect God's tithes and our offerings that we may place ourselves and all that God has entrusted to us back for the kingdom of God to be proclaimed.
your hands, sing and clap your hands, sing, dance and clap your hands, sing and clap your hands, sing, dance and clap your hands, sing and clap your hands, sing, dance and clap your hands. Almighty God, we give you thanks for all that you have entrusted to us. We offer back to you a portion of that which you have entrusted to us. Take these gifts, our tithes, our offerings, multiply them. Use them to further not only your ministry here in this place, but your ministry throughout your kingdom, throughout the earth. Together, all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. Let us go to God in a time of prayer. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the many, many ways that you burst forth new life. The ways in which you turn our little death moments. The things that we have failed to do. Those things that we have done which we should not have done. Those moments in our life that make absolutely no sense. And you take those and you turn them into moments of glory. Lord, we lift up to you those who are in the midst of the dark valley in between those times today. Lord, we could be here for days, for weeks, for a week of weeks, and not even come close to lifting up every single prayer that is weighing on our hearts as we gather together today. And yet, because you are God, in a moment you hear all of these words and you hear the groans interceded by the Holy Spirit, and you know us. Allow us to hear you. Allow us to sense your presence in our lives. Allow us to have the power of your Holy Spirit that we may go out with boldness, shouting, He is risen, fully expecting the echoes to come back. He is risen indeed. And yet when we with our human ears, may not hear those echoes. Remind us that those words are being shouted. 
remind us of the ways in which you have been present in our life. Open the eyes of our hearts that we might be able to see those little God moments in the everyday and the ordinary, and that we might be able to talk with one another about them. Allow us to be aware of those moments in which we can ask for more details from those whom you place in our path, not to manipulate and not to force them into belief with you, but to simply engage in conversation and to be able to see their story as a testimony of your presence in their life, even though they may not be able to see it. Lord, as we go out of this place today, may we remember that this celebration does not end now. It's, this is only the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ. May we embark on the journey of Easter season ahead of us, looking forward to a celebration of when your Holy Spirit came upon those disciples when they knew that you were present. May we encounter Christ with one another as we break bread and share meals. May we celebrate your resurrection each and every day and thereby give testimony to the power that you have to overcome death and darkness, that we may see the hope that you have for us. This we pray in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing our testimony, Lift High the Cross.
Just a short time ago, this cross was nothing but old, rugged wood, chicken wire, kind of ugly as it sat there. And yet, as we gathered together, we each had our part in transforming this into something beautiful. As you go from this place today, may you go from this place transformed, knowing that you are beautiful in God's eyes, that you have a testimony, a story to tell. May you go and tell others the good news of Jesus Christ. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, he is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen and amen.